the book of Revelation. And so as an introduction, um, the description of the restored earth with its capital, the New Jerusalem, completes the prophecies of Revelation. In concluding the book, the Apostle John wants to remind his readers of the things he declared in the introduction to pronounce a final warning and to give his closing remarks. I want to read those verses. Chapter 22, verses 6 to 22. And I want to ask someone to read those for me. That's going to be a chore, but I would like you to do that. Go ahead. Thank you. Six, and he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the spirits of the prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must soon take place. Seven, and behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. Eight, and I, John, am the one who has heard and seen these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Nine, and he said to me, See, do not do this. I, I am your fellow servant and your brothers, the prophets, and one of these who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Ten, and he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. 11. Let the unrighteous still do unrighteousness, and let the filthy still be filthy, and let the righteous still do unrighteousness, and let the holy still be holy. 12. Behold, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me to give to each as his work is. 13. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes, and their authority may be over the tree of tree, the tree of life and they may enter the gates into the city. 15, outside of the dogs and the sorcerers and the fornicators and, and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices the lie. 16, I, Jesus, the offspring of David, bright morning star. 17, in the spirit and the bride say, come and let the one who hears say, come and let the one who thirsts come. Let the one who desires take the water of life freely. 18. I, myself, testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues written in the book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of the prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the Holy Spirit, which are written in this book. 20. The one who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, 21, the, birth, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Thank you so much for doing that. This is a, such a wonderful portion of Scripture. It's a portion of Scripture that says, trust the book. We are going to authentic, authenticate the book of Revelation. But it is also a portion that says, the second coming is affirmed. It's going to happen. We've got to look into that. And then there is an appeal. And, the, and that final appeal and warning is an appeal that is made by the Holy Spirit to you and to me altogether. So we're going to unpack that. No, I understand this. The Bible is the Word of God and put together by many, many people, by the, uh, different denominations probably, right? I mean, and uh, they, uh, huh? different, authors. different authors. Different authors, yes. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the decision to make it, to, mm -hmm. put, to include that in the Bible, mm -hmm. based on what? Because, mm -hmm. if, for example, if, for mm -hmm. example, if you are mm -hmm. one of them, and you know the content of the Bible, of all of that, is one of them is about Sabbath, including this, whoever take mm -hmm. out the, the word, mm -hmm. you know, take it out, it's, it's going to be... That's a. Mm -hmm, go ahead. Okay. How is this? They have different understanding of the okay. ah. Ten Commandment. Ah. Okay. The, 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 look. Look. This. The Bible. First of all, let's address the first part of your of your statement. The Bible has come together, and has been tested, tested, to be in cohesiveness with each other. So as you've been studying Revelation. You've noticed that every time 
John provides a prophetic description of the message that he got from the angel, which is the message that the angel got from Jesus, which is the message that Jesus got from the Father, God the Father. You go to the Old Testament and you test it. And when you test and the Old Testament affirms what God has done, then you know that revelation is the Word of God. Because it is in agreement with what the Old Testament has done. By the way, that's the test for all the books of Scripture. Every book of Scripture needs to be, needs to be um, affirmed historically, needs to be affirmed spiritually, and needs to be affirmed through the word of every other piece of Scripture. The Bible was written over a period of 1,500 years. It was written over a significant amount of prophets and apostles. All focusing on the author. The author is Christ. The word of God through Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit. And so this is all in harmony. And I think it is important. That's an important question. And so I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Let's now go back. We've just read verses 6 to 22. These are the last verses of the last chapter of the Bible. The last chapter of Revelation. Let's talk about the authentication of the book of Revelation. The concluding section of Revelation as we have just read in Revelation 22, 6, begins with an affirmation that all John has heard and seen on Patmos is faithful and true. This is what John says. John, Revelation 22, 6. And he said to me, by the way, this is the angel saying to John. John wrote what the angel said. These words are faithful and true. Now, who in Scripture is called faithful and true? Christ. 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 So, the words that Christ provided to the angel, who gave it to Christ? God. So, God and Christ, and for that matter, the Holy Spirit, as He acts among you and I, are all faithful and true. I think it's important that we understand that. John was given the same affirmation earlier, as we read in Revelation chapter 21, verses 5. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. This is significant because as we read in Revelation chapters 3 and chapter 19, Christ is the one who is faithful and true. Revelation 3.14 And to the angel of the church of say, write, these things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So who was instrumental in Making the creation of God. Jesus. All right. Revelation 19, 11. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judge, judges and makes war. And Jesus is the one who sits on the white horse. So he is faithful and true. But Christ is also the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, as we read in Revelation 22, 13. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, Revelation 1, 8. I am He who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Who made that announcement? Jesus did. 
These verses of Scripture affirm that Christ is the A to Z of human history. Is the beginning and the end. Is everything that is that about human history. Secondly, that he knows the end from the beginning. And that he is the one who gave John the prophecies of Revelation to show his people the things which must soon take place as we read in Revelation 22, as we read in Revelation 22, 6. Therefore, the prophecies of Revelation are as reliable as Christ is reliable, and they will all surely come true. I want you to trust that. We're going to unpack that a little bit. These verses provide us with a strong reminder that Jesus himself, and not the Apostle John, is the author of Revelation. So I'm going to ask you, who is the author of Revelation? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus himself. Of course, through his Father. Because the book begins with the declaration that it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 1.1. 1, 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. Things which must shortly take place. And Christ sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Revelation in both from Christ, uh, the revelation is both from Christ and about Christ. As Revelation 1-2 tells us, John simply witnessed what Christ showed him in vision and faithfully recorded what he, we, he saw and heard. Revelation 1 2. John, who bore witness to the Word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Revelation's conclusion also affirms that Jesus is the book's author. In Revelation 22 16, Jesus identifies himself in the first person. Revelation 22 16. I, Jesus, I have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the sprout and the offspring of David, and the bright morning star. That's a powerful statement. I'm the sprout. Why is he the sprout? Because he's the seed that God made sure to place. As he became, as he took a human mental and walk the streets of this earth to save you and to save me. Incredible. Just incredible. So this statement is Jesus' signature in the book. In the verse we've just read, Christ clearly states that the prophecies of Revelation have come from him. He also states that the prophecies of Revelation are written for the churches, both of John's day and throughout history. In these prophecies, Christ unveils the church's future until the end of earth's history. He has not given us the prophecies of Revelation to satisfy our curiosity about the future, but to assure his people of his presence with them until he comes back and takes them to their eternal home. So, who's the author of the book of Revelation? Jesus. Jesus Christ is. And I hope that you have embraced it. The second coming affirmed. Daniel. The second coming affirmed. Three times... In this concluding section of Revelation, Jesus reminds his people that he is coming soon. Revelation chapter 22, verses 7, Revelation 22, verses 12, and Revelation 22, verses 20. Read, let's read these verses. Verse 7. And behold, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. I want you to begin to own the scripture. Verses 12. Behold, I'm coming soon. 
And my reward is with me to give to each of his work, to, to give to each as his work is, to each one of us as we perform our responsibilities. Verse 20. The one who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen, come Lord Jesus. As we read in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, the return of Christ is the book's keynote. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. So, God's people must live in constant expectation of Christ's imminent coming. And I'm going to ask the question, is that what you sort of look at every day? Does that thought come to mind on a daily basis? Because that's really something that you and I should be looking forward to, Christ's coming. In reference to his coming, Jesus does not use the future tense, I will come. That's not what he says. Instead, as we read, as we read in Revelation chapter 22, 20, Christ uses the progressive futuristic present tense. I am coming and I am coming soon. And why is it that God makes this a present tense? Explanation of his coming. Because when I am ready, and you are ready to meet the Lord. We are ready now. And when God comes, whatever that time is, He comes and I will be brought to Him because I'm ready and I'm ready now. I hope that that explains a little bit. Once again, overwhelmed by what he has just seen and heard, the Apostle John prostrates himself to worship the angel speaking to him. Revelation 22, verses 8. And I, John, am the one who has heard and seen these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. However, as previously stated in Revelation chapter 19, verses 10, the angel warns John not to do that. Revelation 19, 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. What is the angel really saying to John? John, you were created. God created you. And I was also created like you. And we share the same God. Worship God, says the angel, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You see, only God is to be worshipped. The angel, as we read in Revelation 22.9, is only a servant in service to John and to his fellow prophets and all who heed the words of the prophecy recorded in Revelation. Subsequently, as we read in Revelation 22.10, the angel instructs John not to seal the prophecies, prophecies of Revelation. Here's what it says, Revelation 22.10. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. This instruction given to the Apostle John contrasts what the, uh, with the command given to the prophet Daniel to seal the end time prophecies of this book. Let's read Daniel. Daniel chapter 12, verses 4 and 9. But you, Daniel, verse 4, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the, of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Verse 9. And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed, closed up, and sealed, 
until the time of the end. See, there's a big difference between the prophecies given to Daniel and the prophecies given to John. The prophets given to the prophecies given to Daniel, which really are for for the most very similar to the prophecies given to John, were referring to a time still to come. And so Daniel was asked, seal the book. And why is that? Because there was no understanding of what the prophecies really meant. But in John's time, the time is near. So John, don't you dare to seal that book. And the reason for that is that these prophecies are coming into existence as we speak. I hope you see that. Okay. So note, the reason for this prohibition, and we're talking about Daniel sealing the book, was that those prophecies given to Daniel concerning events that were to take place in the distant future, and as such, they were not relevant to the people of Daniel's time. On the other hand, as we read in Revelation 20 to 10, the prophecies of Revelation were not to be kept sealed, for the time is near, says God. These prophecies have to be repeatedly read and studied by God's people as this world's history nears its end. Revelation chapter 1, verses 3 says, Blessed is he who does what? Reads, Reads and Hears. those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. That's why we know uh, those prophecies are not sealed. And when somebody tells you, well, those prophecies don't apply to us. They apply to the end time. That is not true. That is just not true. Okay? All right. Now, as, um, as we read in Revelation 20 to 11, a declaration is made in connection with the nearness of Christ's coming. Here's what the text says, Revelation 20 to 11. Let the unrighteous still do unrighteousness. And let the filthy still be filthy. And let the righteous still do righteousness. And let the holy still be holy. When does Jesus apply these words? Close of probation. Close of probation. Right so, so, right. Right before the seven last plagues. La right before the seven last plagues. Before his coming. So if the Lord is saying this to you, how soon do you think is this coming? Mm. But, we still have an but we still have an opportunity right now. That's why we study Revelation. Why do we study Revelation? So the Holy Spirit can encourage us to understand our God, Jesus, to know what he's doing in heaven for us. And to understand that the promises he's made for you and for me will be fulfilled. And prophetically, he has exposed how those will be fulfilled. Uh, this is happening when we are sealed, right? Say it again. So, is this happening when we are sealed? Yes. No, well, this, the... this has happened when we are sealed or when we have perpetually rejected Christ so the and the Holy Spirit. Probation will be once right. we are right. sealed. But right. I mean, part of Revelation is before the close of probation. Correct. That one is the seven trumpets is before the close of probation. So part of Revelation is talking to us today to make a choice for him. Correct. But oh. eventually part of Revelation will talk about once we have been sealed. Yeah. So it's okay. telling us what's going to happen. Go ahead. They'll either have the seal of God or the mark of or the beast. Or the mark of the beast. That's, that's really the way it is. Yes. But uh, your statement is right. Okay, so next, as we read in Revelation 20 to 11, a declaration is made in connection with the nearness of Christ. No, uh, we've read that, sorry. I was going to repeat this. This declaration parallels the unsealing, let's, let's look at it, the unsealing of Daniel's end time prophecies. 
He tells us that those who will heed the prophecies will be separated from those who will reject them. Daniel 12, 10 tells us that those who accept the prophecies will be purged, purified, and refined, but the wicked will continue to act wickedly, to act wickedly. He tells us that none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. This is how Daniel wrote in chapter 12, verses 10. Many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but those who have insight will understand. See, Revelation 22, 11 tells you and I, tells us that people can reject the prophetic message for some time. Unfortunately, however, the time is coming when it will be too late to change. At a certain point in history, prior to Christ's coming, the door of opportunity, of the door of probation, uh, the door of opportunity to repent and turn to God will close. The door of probation will close and grace will no longer be available. When this happens, when the door of opportunity to repent and turn to God is closed, Christ will reward each according to his or her works. As we read in Revelation 22, 12, Behold, says God, I, or in this case, Jesus, of course, I am coming soon and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. The Apostle John, in Revelation chapter 7, verses 14, reminds us that the way to enter into eternal life is to have one's robe washed in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 7, 14, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This is the last of the seven Beatitudes, by the way. The clean and white robes stand for the righteous deeds of the saints. As we read in Revelation 19, 8, it tells us, and to her, to her whom? The church. The church. The church. To her, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, Clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. The robes are made white by the Lamb's blood, as we've just read in Revelation 7, 14. At the cross, when Christ shed blood for you and for me, your sins and my sins were cleansed. The robe is made white. Therefore, the righteous deeds of God's people are the result of Christ's outworking in their lives. Remember, this is not about your righteousness and my righteousness because we are filthy rags. Our character is defined as a filthy rag. This is about Christ's righteousness. Christ's right righteousness. Okay? It is because of Christ, it is because of what Christ has done for them and in them that they will stand in the presence of God and serve Him continually in His temple. The New Jerusalem. Revelation 7.15 tells us, therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will dwell among them. It's a beautiful picture. Beautiful. Here we are. When we, by faith, accept Christ's grace and death for us at the cross, we are called children of God. As Christ comes for his family, the children of God, he will make sure that you are cloaked with a robe of his righteousness. And as you enter the new Jerusalem, all in that robe, you not only are wearing 
a priestly robe given to you by Christ is righteousness. But you become a hearer of the kingdom and you will sit at the throne of God. And as the verse we just read, you will serve with God at his tabernacle, his sanctuary. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. I have a question about the wicked, the weak become wickedly. Uh, is that before the close of probation, during the close of probation? Uh, well, it, what were, uh, the, the, uh, Daniel, Daniel 12, 10? He says, many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wicked shall be wickedly. At the time of probation, when probation closes, when there is no more atonement for anyone in heaven, when the heaven is full of smoke, remember last Friday's description, when heaven is full of smoke and there's no activity in the tabernacle, the wicked will be wickedly still. Right. Okay, does that make sense? But for us, we still have to practice every day, right? To be able to exercise them. We have to every day ask for forgiveness. Every day we've got to be forgiven by Jesus. Every day we've got to reconcile with Christ. Every day I need to, to make sure that my heart is right with God and with my fellow men and women, my neighbor. The 12th then also applies even before the close of probation because it says many shall be purified and made white and tried. So we're being tried and purified, but the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand. And it's right before the uh, 1260 days prophecy. So it, you know, those that are standing with God, they'll continue to be purified during the trial. Well, the ones that are not standing in the yeah. I, 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 I think the definition uh, is correct. I, am, I was addressing a question regarding the wickedly, become, being wicked. There is always an opportunity for any, in, for any human being. We all wicked. We all sinners. There is an opportunity given to us 24-7, 365, every day until the close of probation. What I'm saying is, this is a warning for us. Right? Yeah, of course. Like every day. Like, of course. Because we don't know when it's time. Of course. You know, I mean, for us, is the advantage for us to know this. That's exactly. Better. Exactly. And, uh, and, uh, and when we finish this section, we will address that a little bit because there is a final appeal and a warning. And we will get there in, in, in a bit. Great discussion, good questions. Revelation 22.15 identifies the wicked. So, who is the wicked? Well, here's the wicked. They are dogs, or as Matthew says in chapter 7, verse 6, the unholy ones. And they are sorcerers, and sexually moral, and murderers, and idolaters, and all who love and practice a lie. These are the wicked. And, by the way, this is a good description of who we are. But when we come to Christ every day, all the time, and He forgives us and cleans our heart and purifies our mind and our heart, we live in harmony with God. But should the time come when I reject God and the Holy Spirit, that's who I look like. Permanently, when I reject God and the Holy Spirit permanently. Okay. As Revelation tells us in Revelation 21.8, the wicked are excluded from the city. Their fate ends in the lake of fire. Revelation 21.8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable murderers, sexually moral, sorcerers, idolaters and no liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. 
All right. Revelation does not end without an appeal. And we are going to, to, to look at the appeal. And this appeal is driven by the Holy Spirit daily. Speaking to you and to me on a daily basis. In response to Jesus' declaration that he is coming soon, the Holy Spirit makes a call through the bride. Who's the bride of Christ? Church. The church. Through the bride, the church. Who's the church? Us. You and I. Us. So the Holy Spirit is working in you individually and in us collectively who claim to be the church of God. Okay. So what is the call? To come, Revelation 22, 17. Those who respond positive, positively must call others to come to Christ. Revelation 22, 17. And the Spirit and the Bride say, come. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts, come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Wonderful verse. Wonderful. This call echoes Jesus' appeal at the Feast of Booths. By the way, what did the Feast of Booths represent in the Old Testament? Um, when they were sheltered by God. Yes. The well, Feast of Booths was dwelling with God. Do right. Exactly, the dwelling of God. And the dwelling of God called to His coming. Yes, that's very good, very good. So what does it say? John 7, 37. On the last day, the great day of the Feast of Booths, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The water Christ talks about is a free gift. He tells us in Revelation 21, 6, I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. The water of life will quench the thirst of every person who drinks it. The water spoken of by Christ refers to the message of Revelation. You see, the prophecies of Revelation, Daniel and Revelation, but the prophecies and the man message of Revelation is divine water, is water that consoles, is water that removes the thirst is water that provides life. It really is. So note, it is not enough just to read Revelation. We must drink its words and study its messages, treasuring them in our minds and hearts. Revelation chapter 1 verses 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy. And keep those things which are written in it. Revelation 22, 7. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. In Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, Jesus warns against adding to or removing from the words of the book's prophecy. Revelation 22, 18 and 19. Pay attention. Verse 18. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. What are the plagues? The seven, the seven plagues. Exactly. Verse 19. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the Holy Spirit, and from the things which are written in this book. If my name and your name is not in the book of life, what does that mean? We're not there. We are not going to be invited to be part of the family of God and live with God forever. Yeah. This warning echoes the admonition of Moses to Israel at the end of their wilderness journey. And I want you, to, before we read Deuteronomy, 
I want you to understand that there is a parallel. Moses brought Israel, God through Moses, brought Israel from Egypt all the way to the borders of the new of, of Canaan. All they needed to do was to cross the river into Canaan. And Moses spent some time before, before Joshua took over. Moses, uh, uh, Moses spent some time talking to the people of Israel about what it needed to happen as they occupied Canaan. Similarly, with Revelation, we are at the door of God's second coming. Mm -hmm. And Christ uses Revelation to give us insight, a perspective, a counsel, advice, and a call. For the time is near. Very similar. So now let's go back to Moses and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verses 2. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you. Nor take away from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I commanded you. Moses was concerned about commandment faithfulness and commandment keeping. Deuteronomy 12, 32. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, not take away from it. Likewise, Christ, through the angel to John, says, I need to do what? I need to hear the words of prophecy and keep those. He's coming quickly. So I need to keep the words of the prophecy of Revelation. The Apostle John tells us that Revelation is the Word of God given to Christ. Revelation chapter 1 verses 2. John who bore witness to the Word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Tempering with the prophecies of Revelation carries far-reaching consequences. Those who add to the prophet to the prophetic words of the book are threatened with the plagues described in the book. Those who subtract from it will be deprived of eternal life in the New Jerusalem. Please understand that this warning is not about tempering with the actual words of Revelation as of, uh, as of some concept of verbal inspiration was at stake. Not at all. Adding to the words of Revelation or Revelation's prophecies has to do with distorting and misinterpreting those prophecies to suit one's own purpose. It also has to do with enforcing speculative ideas and views not warranted by the text. This particularly applies to the end time prophecies of Revelation. Please remember that we are dealing with unfulfilled prophecies which we will only fully understand after they have been fulfilled as the apostle um, as the apostle paul states in uh, as the apostle john states in john 14:29 where he says and now i have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass you may believe what is john really saying you see we look at these prophecies and often we look at those and we say, and I, I just don't know. Is this really true? Is this going to happen? And by the way, there's nothing wrong in asking that question. But if the Lord tells you study, if the Lord tells you embrace it, and John is saying, I know that when you are going to read my letter to the seven churches, with all the prophetic information, you are going to say, is this really true? Was John in sound mind when he wrote it? Then remember, and I think that's, that's important, remember that when it does come to pass, you will believe.
And so let me ask you a question. Have you seen some of the prophecies of Daniel in Revelation taking place? Oh, yes. 2,300 days. What's the other one? 1,000. The Messiah. Uh, the, re the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Christ in the well, most holy place. Yeah, yeah. Church, in the wilderness. church in the wilderness. Absolutely. That should give us encourage to know that the pro prophecies that were written are true and they are taking place and will be fulfilled as discussed. Okay. So, um, on the other hand, one may take away from the words of Revelation by deliberately undermining their divine origin and their prophetic character because it might look unpopular or not be widely accepted. A person who responds to Revelation in this way is just as guilty of tempering with the book's prophecies as the one who adds to it. Both will suffer eternal loss. Once again, and for the last time, Christ reminds readers that he will quickly return. Revelation 22, 20, first half. He who testifies to these things says, who testifies to these things? Jesus Christ says, surely I'm coming soon. And so on behalf of God's people, you and I, those before us, those that are still coming, the Apostle John responds with a longing explanation. And that's a beautiful response. Revelation 22, 20, second half. Amen, says the Apostle John. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The book of Revelation closes with a benediction. Revelation 22, 21. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. You see, this phrase is much more than just a customary benediction. Its purpose is to assure God's people, you and I, throughout history, that their only hope is in Christ's grace, not your righteousness, not what you think is your goodness, not what you think is your good deeds, but Christ's grace. Christ is the answer to all human hopes and longings amidst the enigmas and uncertainties of life. The future may look frightening and gloomy, but God will always be with his people until the very time of the end. Matthew tells us of this promise in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, where he tells us, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I want you to know, this commission can only be fulfilled when your heart is in tune with God, when your mind is being filled with God's truth, and when you make a decision to be a servant of God in your home, in your environment, and wherever you go. God holds the future in his hand. His grace expressed in Christ and the Trinity is promised to all who take the messages of Revelation seriously. His grace will e equip his people to go through the tumultuous times of the final crisis. It is through Christ's grace that Revelation's prophecies and promises will become a reality. When Christ comes back and claims his faithful people and his bride and brings them to their eternal home. Through Christ's grace, the revelations, the, the, uh, it is through Christ's grace that Revelation's prophecies and promises will become a reality. I hope that uh, your study of Revelation for these 24 weeks 
have been enjoyable, have been a blessing. I hope that you have really brought this information into your heart and mind. And I hope that you look forward every day to the coming of God. Amen. I really appreciate you being here. And I want to ask you, is there anything, is there anything in this uh, presentation tonight that um, you, um, you perhaps did not quite understand, that you want some clarification? Is there any questions that you have? Is there any, any, uh, anything that you want to share with us as we've come to an end and we've studied um, an end of, uh, of unpacking Revelation uh, chapter by chapter and verse by verse? If there is, please share it with us. Please ask the question. Brian? How do you reconcile the close of probation with, the, uh, with Jesus looking for his last sheep to bring him in the fold? Jesus is currently looking for the last sheep. He is the shepherd. And the picture that I've always had in my life, uh, when, when I embraced Christ and, and became part of his church, the picture that I have of Christ, and I actually have that picture in my living room or in my house, is that he's a true, sh a true sh a shepherd. He looks, he makes sure that the church most of the sheep, the sheep that are together, stay together. And he goes and looks for the sheep that are missing. He personally, as a shepherd, goes and looks for the sheep that are missing. He personally gathers the sheep. And he carries the sheep to the fold. Christ is doing that right now. That Christ will do. Until probation comes to an end. Oh, and actually, before probation, there's the latter rain. There's well. the latter rain, so which that will be yes. the God really, the Holy Spirit pouring it down. Right. And that will be really the last call for people. Correct. To come. Correct. But until until Christ is in the in the most holy place in the sanctuary, ministering for you and for me, He is the Good Shepherd. And so, there is always an opportunity to come to the fold. And as, as, as uh, Byron stated correctly, we will be seeing, we are already seeing somewhat, but we will be seeing very shortly the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in a way that we probably have never seen before. And there will be a lot of people that will be touched by the truth and the Holy Spirit, and they will leave Babylon as you and I studied in Revelation. Is that a ladder ring? And that's the ladder ring. And they will work towards God's people and God's church. Very good question. Yeah, the, the ladder ring is to bring God's people to Him. Correct. That's correct. And so those who are God's people or want to be God's people correct. will be poured out by the ladder with, it, with the ladder ring. That's correct. Very good. Any other? That was a great question. Any other observation? Any other just, question? Just, yes. a, just a quick statement. A lot of people look at Revelation and they're like, oh, it's too hard or it's too symbolic or whatever. And God did not design it that way. I mean, I've heard pastors say it scared them when they were younger and so they don't want to teach it. And yet we're supposed to read God's word. Yep. And so even with the book like Plague Revelation, it's revelation for those that are challenged by, by symbology and all these other things. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, uh, I particularly appreciate this uh, way of studying revelation because we've studied revelations for years, jumping around, but just following through line by line in the order that it's written has been very helpful for me to get a big picture. Because before I have pictures of this here and this there, but I never saw this in a complete yeah. right. for the first time I see it in a complete way. Right. Now, uh, I was like, as you speaking of the Holy Spirit, you see it now. Right. 
Mm-hmm. Are you calling it blabbering? No, the Holy Spirit is working consistently. But just before Christ comes, just like Pentecost yeah. during the first century, there will be a significant outpouring mm. of the Spirit. And the evidence of Christ becomes a lot more visual. Uh, vivid. Uh, vivid. Like vivid when, is the when, word. When, in when the we're mind. thinking of the Pentecost, it was that a lot of people in a very short time they got baptized. They, also people were speaking in languages and people were hearing people speaking their own languages. There were people there from all around the world, especially for the, right. the events that were happening in Jerusalem. And they, there was also physical manifestation where you have, it is described as tongues of fire over each person. So it was a physical and a, where it convicted everyone that was present. So it was a powerful working unlike any other of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're expecting in the right. latter rain. It's not just the Holy Spirit. It's just like an extra measure. Right. And comparatively Spirit. speaking, the former rain was not as much as the latter rain in correct. the, in the that's analogy correct. of it. So, that's correct. And it makes sense because God's last chance to save people is the latter rain before right. probation closes. That's correct. So you're going to see more than you saw at Pentecost. Right. Let, 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 me, let me bring this particular discussion into this, the, this uh, composite. Right now, we have freedom and liberty, particularly in this country. There are countries like North Korea, even countries uh, where a dictatorial regimes, uh, regimes exist, where there is no freedom. No freedom. Those people to really worship a God the way the Bible teaches them to, to teach often are being persecuted, are being challenged. But let's look at the situation that we have. Freedom and liberty. When the freedom and liberty we experience is going to be removed slowly but surely. And by the way, it's going to be. That's part of the prophetic message, the prediction. And we've studied that. When that is going to do to, to take place, what's the counteraction that 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 the divine that heaven uses to make sure that you look at it differently? When you are going through challenges, when pain increases, when difficulty increases, when life becomes a real, really difficult, the latter rain, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit provides an opportunity for people to say, wait a minute, my journey isn't getting anywhere. There's got to be a solution. And my solution needs to be to get back to Scripture, to follow it, and to follow my God. And Paul said it when sin abounds, grace abounds also. Correct. God always keeps the balance. Correct. Oh, I, uh, I really hope that you, you enjoyed it. Now do me a favor. Um, keep on studying Revelation. Review what you've learned on a regular basis. This is the prophetic message. By the way, Revelation is a gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are gospels. And the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John bring to you good news. And what's the good news? Jesus. Why is he the good news? Because he came to earth it died for you and for me. And because of His amazing grace and His love and the love that the Father has, by faith in what He did at the cross, I can have eternal life. Amen. I can be saved. Revelation is a gospel. And the gospel of Revelation is all about good news. 
And what's the good news of the gospel of Revelation? First, because Revelation tells us what God is doing in heaven. He's interceding on your behalf and my behalf. Mm -hmm. He's interceding for everyone who, like the thief at the cross, or Mary, or anyone in scripture that we, we read about, anyone who says, Lord, have mercy on me, save me. He's interceding. But remember when, when the groom, when Christ the groom left the earth, and was glorified after his resurrection. And he was made the ruler and the king of the, of, 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 the, of the world and the universe. And he paid his dowry at the cross. What did he do? He told you and he told me. I'm going to prepare a place for you. You are part of the bride that I want to. I want to marry. You are part of my church. And my church and the New Jerusalem are my bride. And I want to marry you. Prepare yourself for my coming. I will be coming back once I have prepared the house, the home. And by the way, the home that I have prepared is my father's home. You and I, the bride and the groom, are going to live with the Father forever. That's what the Lord is saying. And I can tell you that the good news of Revelation is that God has given you a ladder, given me a ladder as a member of his church, as a member of the bride. And that ladder tells us exactly what is going to happen, how it's going to happen. It doesn't tell me when it is going to happen, but it gives me enough evidence to say, Victor, it is going to happen. Prepare yourself for my coming. That's the challenge for you and for me. And then he says, while you prepare yourself, make sure that those around you know that they know the truth, that they know what you know. Share it. Witness. And invite them to be part of the church. He don't tell them. He gave signs for her. Right. Right. He gave signs for us. Uh, yes, yeah. he gave well, signs. He didn't tell us when. So Correct. He, gave us he gave us the old signs. So Absolutely right. 100%. So we know the season. We know the season. Right. We know where we are. Like we were talking about the trumpets. The trumpets do what? They make an announcement. They provide a warning. I believe that the sixth trumpet is playing as we speak. Now, don't ask me, why, can I prove that? No, I can, I can show you, I can show you why I do believe that. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, to say this is what the Bible says. No. Right. But you can tell by the season. The season. You're not exactly. there, you're still very close. That's exactly right. That's exactly. So we are very, very close. Why do, why do I know that? When I look at the transformation that has taken place in our nation alone, I don't need to look anywhere else. But when I see what is taking place in the United States of America alone, I know that the prophetic message is being fulfilled as we speak. Repentance in choir every day. Right? Yes. Every choir, like you have all. Yes. But then sometimes every minute of every day. minute of every day. Oh, yeah. exactly I mean, right. but then if you have. Uh, no, change your character yet. Does mean you're, you're the wicked become wickedly? If you know, let, let, let me answer this question, this question. If you know that your character is not what it should be. It's not in it, line with God. It's not in line with God. Then the Holy Spirit is working with you. That's the only reason you know that. 
And what that means is that the, the Holy Spirit is really saying, you're not quite there yet. Please transform, turn my, turn change, to me. turn to me. Because repent really means you make a U-turn. You no longer Correct. do what you're doing. So Correct. you might try and repent and not quite make it. Correct. But that doesn't mean that you're done. You still have the opportunity until probation closes. Correct. In, in fact, Illinois talks about this. Yes. It's... It's the trajectory of your life. Yes. It's not the one sin that you do. Correct. I go out and I sin today, and it, it, it's not the one sin. It's are you continuing to sin or are you moving towards God? Correct. Uh, and the Bible says, right. like, for instance, um, I forgot the verse, love covers a multitude of sins. So if your character in your life right. changes, you don't have to go through why. In fourth grade, I did this, or you know, two years ago, I did this. God knows your character. Right. Your, our journey. Our journey is defined in three parts. When I accepted Christ's sacrifice for me at the cross, and I embraced it by faith, I have been justified. Upon my justification, Christ wants me to walk with Him. The Holy Spirit being an in inerrant helper in the journey. That walk with Christ is my sanctification walk. As Byron has stated, the sanctification is a journey. As Barbara stated, the sanctification is a journey. And being who we are, that walk with Christ is not going to be straight and arrow, unfortunately, which is the walk that God wants us to have with Him. Straight and arrow. That walk will unfortunately have deviations. For as long as we come back to the straight and arrow, mm -hmm. and for as long we, 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 we ask for forgiveness when we say to the Lord, I'm sorry. I want to drive. I don't want you to drive. In other words, I want to be in control of my thoughts and my actions. And God really says, no, no. I want to be in control of your thoughts and your actions. But for as long as I come back to the narrow and straight, and I end my life with the narrow and straight, I will be glorified in Christ, which is the third stage. Justification, sanctification, glorification. Great. Interesting. When you um, close to God, when you pray every day, and you ask for Him to show who you are, He shows us. Oh, absolutely. But mm -hmm. He's so patient. He knows showings once, little by little. Little by little. And sometimes when you pray and you stay, when I hear his voice, he reminds us some sin you have long, long time ago. Exactly. For we has a chance for asking for forgiveness. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And and by the way, that's how that's how God works. And that's that's the influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Um, I ask God every day to purify my character, to purify my heart. Mm -hmm. I ask God every day for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Because I am concerned, not only with what happened today, what may happen tomorrow, and what has happened in the past. And there often, when I say to the Lord, Lord, I want to make sure that the book of Life of the Lamb has my name in it. And if it has my name in it, then the book of records, the only thing that I want in that book of records is the good things that I did that glorify God. You got a lot of blank spots in there. <laughs> covered by Christ. Co covered by Christ. Exactly. Yeah, I used so when, to... Oh, okay. Go ahead. I used to tell my uh, 
my siblings, my family, I said, if we can't see our mistake, if we can't see our sin, this means there's no Holy Spirit showing it to us. There's no repentance. I mean, yes. if you don't know your weakness, if you don't, if you can't see your mistake, sometimes we have to pray for our conviction to show it, so we know that we're doing wrong, and then we can change. I'm going to say, 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 say it differently. Yeah. Just say God it. knows when you're ready. <laughs> yes. And when you're ready, He brings it to your attention. Yeah. Because if he, he knows you're not ready yet to deal with that sin, you're just spinning your wheels. Right. Yeah, yes. Uh, I, I think uh, your husband defined it well. Uh, can I define it differently? Okay. When you have a deficiency, a vision deficiency, and you cannot really see, and you cannot really see, does it mean that what you cannot see doesn't exist? No. What you cannot see is still there. The reason you cannot see is maybe because you're affected by your vision. You're not looking at it. It perhaps is not something that is important or significant that you have not prioritized. See, the Holy Spirit is functioning all the time. The only time the Holy Spirit does not function when he is totally rejected. rejected. Yeah. Or, and, you know, Eva, King David said, Lord, search my heart. Is there any wicked way in me? If there is, lead me in the way everlasting. Yes. Mm -hmm. exactly. and, and that's a prayer that we can offer. Yeah. And you might not even be aware that that's a dangerous spot. Yeah. But at the closer you get to God, oh, yes. things that you used to think yes. were okay once upon a time, you're like, uh, I don't think I should do that anymore. Yeah. You know, no. I didn't I didn't know that until recently, like maybe like five years ago. Sure. Mm -hmm. That I cannot see my sin. I, I never see myself wrong. I yeah. never you know, until I pray for the convictions. Yeah. Lord show me. Right. Where I, need to, where I need to be changed. And you know when you do that, you really to say to the Lord, Lord, I want to be humble. I really want to be able to prioritize you in my life. That's part of the humbleness. And Lord, come into my life. Show me who you are. Help me understand when I open your word what I read. Show me how you would like me to journey with you. It is amazing what God does when we pray that way. Mm. But I've got to be humble. The mistake that often Christians have is when I get into trouble, not that God doesn't help and assist, I turn around and say, God, I'm in trouble. Help me. And God often does that. But the best way to journey is to really diligently, daily, give your heart to the Lord and your mind to the Lord. Embed on His Word. And ask the Holy Spirit to guide you so you may understand. And I tell you what, God is incredible. And you, we all, all of us, have had experienced God's blessings. Kay Kaylee has a question. Kaylee. Well, it wasn't a question. I just wanted to say that um, God can give you a spirit of discernment if you pray to him. And exactly. And his word, reading his word. You'll find and read it by learning Absolutely, what is Katie. wrong, what is right, the differences between the between the two, and like what you should or shouldn't do. Absolutely, Katie. Dead on. Why right is this in the Bible? Why wrong is this in the Bible? It's all in there. It's exactly, yeah. Katie. Absolutely, dead on. Well, I uh, I've enjoyed I've enjoyed this part of the presentation a lot. <laughs> Out the faith for 40 years. 
she raised him seven days and teases she go in the school in the car, um, dormitory school blah, boarding blah. school boarding school yes yeah. so year ago she knows uh, she saw um, an interview with the um, I don't remember exactly, but I see the last name is Moore. He said from Tommy Canada. Huh? I don't know. He his was in the um, he knows everything about Satan and okay. um, he's seven day Adventist and, and okay. he talk about his uh, life. Mm -hmm. So he say if he, every day you read one verse the Bible mm -hmm. after a year you you, you change mm -hmm. right and for her it's a big challenge she says yes. I doubt yeah I say okay <laughs> we talk every day so so I think more than a year she have been doing this and we talk and sometimes I change um, like uh, message for her and saying to her the Bible quotes. Anyway, let yesterday, uh, today she called me seven times. I yeah, know answer, and she said, Why oh, you don't answer? So she says she has a dream, and somebody said to her, You have to speak in front of the in one convention, it's just high class. And she said, but I have an accent, you know. This is her <laughs> concern. And she said, no, you have to do. And the time, she said, well, I have to read. He said, the Psalm 9. 90? 19. 19. 19 or 90? 19. 19. 19. 19. 19. 19. 19. 19. They're both. 90. 90. 90. 90. 90. They're, ver they're both very good psalms. And the time she started to read, he said, no, go to 99. Oh, okay. And then she said, you know, this is for me, impact me a lot, because the life is so foolish. She, she had quite money, and then she's, she enjoy life, she travel a lot. And she said, you know, Marcia, this is for me. And then the 99, she said, how oh, God is so so sad. She said, I don't realize that. So I'm happy. And she said, You have to be. So even I talk to her for 40 years, I pray for her and say to her things. God um, see one way for talk to her. Yeah, in other words, yeah. she, she found another way to be impressed, to read right. the word. Right, to, to read the word. God spoke to her. To read the word. Yeah. The, That's, Holy, the Holy Spirit, yeah, we so. don't convict. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts us. Okay. Yeah. So, so did, did, did you read Psalm 99? Uh, 99, no. Nine, so so let, let me read just the first two or three verses. It's the dream was 99. Oh. They stay so, for the boat, she had to read. Okay, so, so let me just read uh, a, a couple of verses, and you can begin to see how things work. The Lord reigns. Let the, prop, the, the, let the people tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is high above all the people. Let them praise your great and awesome name, for he is holy. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> so, not even this one. It's amazing. It's amazing. God, God at work is amazing. Anything else I want to... Um, yes. Um, do you have an extra copy of that book? Yeah. Uh, this, this, oh, yeah, I gotta hear her. Yeah. No, okay. I got one, I got one here. All right. We, we had a wonderful conversation. We had a wonderful 24 weeks. We had a wonderful time studying Revelation together. I want to close now with prayer. 
And I'm going to, uh, to obviously thank you for joining with us, Byron and Barbara and I were just delighted to, to be able to uh, be a servant and uh, lead in each one of these presentations. So and let's, uh, thank, let's... And thank you for Brian for being faithful. Yes. Oh, sure. And uh, yeah, Brian, you, and uh, sometimes yeah. Jill, yeah. and sometimes Barbara, you are like always making, and Armin, oh, always making sure <laughs> that uh, technology takes the message to the homes. So Marcia and that's asked wonderful. What's next? Okay, let's pray. Victor, they're asking what's next. Let's pray. <laughs> if I had, if I knew what was next, I would say it openly. But uh, let's pray. Remind people too. Yes. Money too. Okay. Uh, oh, um, gracious heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for your amazing grace. Lord, what a privilege! What a privilege it is that you have given us not only to have your word in written and electronically available to us, but Lord, to have left the Holy Spirit behind so that we could understand what we read every day. Amen. Heavenly Father, we know that you're coming. We know that you're coming is soon. We know that you love us. Your love is unconditional. We know, Lord, that God the Father loves us with an agape love. And that in you, O oh Lord Jesus, while here on earth, the love of the Trinity was expressed in you at the cross when you died for each one of us. How incredible there is, Father. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the privilege that we have through faith in that which Jesus did for, did, did for each one of us at the cross. And through your grace, we want to thank you for being called members of your family. Amen. Lord, not only do you want us to be members of your family, but you want us to sit at the throne with Jesus Amen. and to be prophets, not prophets, but to be um, Priests. Priests in your temple. Okay. I want to thank you for that. Lord, today, as I close this prayer, I want to ask, oh Father, that you enlighten everyone that has watched and read Revelation. Amen. I want to pray, oh Lord, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in their lives, in their homes. I want to ask, O oh Lord, that they will be urged to continue to study and read and share what they've learned. And I want to ask, O oh Father, that you teach us to die for self every day. Yes. That you teach us, O oh Lord, to be happy to be a passenger. by taking our will and give it to you so that you can mold it into yours. We truly want to get through the Holy Spirit transformed into the character that you want us to have. Amen. Heavenly Father, prepare us to be stewards of the truth and your word every day. Lord, I want to ask that as bond servants, that you take each one of us every day 
and that the character that is being perfected in you through the Holy Spirit may reflect your character, may reflect your light, may reflect, reflect the truth and the light. And finally, O oh Lord, we want to love you with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. And Lord, we want to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Father, transform our heart. Prepare our minds to be of service, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. I want to, uh, before, before I depart, I, I wanted to encourage you, if you felt that these type of meetings were, um, uh, were uh, meetings that you appreciated, that really uh, meetings that, uh, that you would recommend to others, that you, I want to encourage you to uh, provide a donation, if you can, uh, to... Uh, Revelation, uh, what do we call it? Revelation Seminar. To Revelation Seminars. Uh, and your tithe envelope. Uh, and uh, use the tithe envelope to do that. Um, it helps us purchase the uh, materials that we, uh, that we share. And it helps us also ensure that we have equipment and we have uh, everything else that we need to do that. Thank you so much. Happy Sabbath. Have a wonderful day, and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, actually, I should have said, have a wonderful evening and a good night's rest. No. Uh.